All right, well, I'm here with sailor Sarah Douglas, who will be competing for Canada at the Tokyo Olympics in the summer of 2021. Sarah, thanks for being here. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, well, my name's Sarah Douglas, and I am from Toronto, but I actually grew up in Barbados. So I kind of got a bit of the best of the both worlds where um, I got to sail in Barbados throughout the winter. And I got to come to Ontario or to Canada and, and the Great Lakes as well to race the Optimist in the summer. I was part of an Optimist racing team called the Lake Ontario Optimist team. And we kind of like travel around and there was like 10 kids in a van and some parents and a coach. And um, we had a trailer and we kind of travel around North America yeah. and compete. So I really loved the Optimist and all of that. That's awesome. I uh, I I got too big for Optimist when I was like nine. So, <laughs> but I used to. <laughs> that, so I feel that that's awesome. Um, I sailed the Optimist for like seven years. I loved. Yeah. It. Um, I had a great time in the Optimist. So when you started off doing that and you started, you know, getting into this in like a pretty competitive uh, program, pretty young, um, did you imagine that like the the Olympics was your dream that this is we're going to end up going? I never imagined it. Um, you know, I just kind of enjoyed racing, and enjoyed sailing. I didn't ever think about the Olympics. You know, I was never even introduced to it. My parents, uh, my family has no sailing background. Like my brother started it, started it all. Uh, he came to camp in Canada one summer when we were living in Barbados and got introduced to the sport. And then it kind of started as a father son thing. And then um, I joined. And so my family was completely new to sailing. We had never done it. Um, I had never, didn't even know it was in the Olympics. Um, it was, I was not exposed to any sort of Olympic aspect in Barbados. You know, it's not really part of the community or um, culture. So it was something that I never imagined. And my brother actually went to two Olympics in the sport of sailing as well. He went to Beijing and London in 2012. And even when he went, I never thought about it for myself. It just never seemed as part of it for me and then now I've qualified for my first Olympics which yeah I just never would yeah, have guessed. Yeah I mean, that's an amazing path to get there uh, but it's almost kind of funny to think like growing up uh, you know on an island that you really learned to sail you know up in Canada on the Great Lakes and kind of brought that back. So did, would you sail then I guess in the winter would you still compete and train when you're in Barbados? Yeah I actually competed for Barbados um, up to 2008 and so same with my brother we both switched um, countries like fall of 2008 and so um, yeah I got to sail throughout Barbados and I would travel as well I'd compete at different competitions um, for Barbados and then when I was sailing the Great Lakes I'd I'd be doing that as well and then um, switched to Canada and switched boats as well to the laser that I sail now and uh, just kind of progressed but I did I did have a moment where I stopped sailing yeah. <laughs> like, I fully quit and um that's when it I, I stopped for like two years and when i came back that's when my olympic dream was sparked actually by another olympian in the sport of trampoline of all sports <laughs> <laughs> that's uh and some interesting inspiration i guess to get back into it um so what, what was it that drew you back in i guess and it kind of gave you this this dream yeah so essentially what happened to me is that when I was in the Optimist and I was competing in, as a youth competitor, I um, only liked to win. <laughs> it was kind of like I loved to win and hate to lose. And so I came second at the Youth Nationals in 2010 in Ottawa. And I mean, second is an incredible achievement, but I was winning the event until the last day. And so that blow was really, really big for me. And I ended up saying, you know what, this is it. I don't love the sport anymore. Um, I'm done sailing next summer. I'm going to go to volleyball camp is what I told my dad. And we kind of had a compromise that I would do one month of sailing. And then eventually I started coaching. Um, I coached the optimist cause I loved it so much. And during that time I was kind of sailing for fun and I hopped in a, a boat a couple times to just race and have fun. And I ended up qualifying being an alternate for the Canada summer games where I was exposed to um, various athletes from across different sports. Um, within Canada and uh, on the last day they had an athlete panel and that's where there were a number of um, Pan Am athletes, Para Pan Am, Olympic athletes and one of them was um, Rosie McLennan who's our one of our gold medalists in the sport of trampoline and she had just come back from London um, with her gold medal and she was talking about it 
and her experience and you know the journey and, and what it was like to stand on the podium representing Canada and that was that weekend I was like whoa what am I doing um I want to do that same thing I want to stand on the podium and win a medal for Canada and so from there in 2013 I went right back into it and seeked out all the different coaches all the advice you know how can I get back into training because I certainly was not in shape and so I had to completely change my lifestyle eating gym everything to get back to training and eventually qualify for the national team that's awesome that's a a really cool story um I should probably back up a little bit though because for our non-sailors in the audience um this is all probably pretty foreign can you talk about the event you compete in the the class you sail in Mm mm-hmm so I compete in the Laser Radial. It's actually recently gone through a class change name. So it's the Ilka 6. Um, it's one one sail, 14 feet, very simple. Every boat is actually pretty much the same. It is a one design class. So it really comes down to the sailor. Uh, we're considered like the slow boat of the Olympics. So it actually comes, uh, turns into a lot of strategy and technique and positioning against other competitors. Um, each race is about an hour long and we do two a day and we compete over six days. Do you have to bring your own boat when you go to the games or is it like everything's provided and, and level? Uh, the boats are provided for us in the laser at the Olympics and uh, we have to bring our own like lines and equipment and all that other extra stuff. But the main hall is, is supplied. So it's pretty much like a dead level playing field for everybody. Yeah, you know, we go through a lottery system where it's, okay, this is your boat, this is your, you do a lottery for what boat you get chosen, and that's it. Like, it is your boat, and you got to race it and be the best in the world with that. Do they, uh, this is not not for the non-sailors, though, do they let you bring your own foils? Like, oh, really? No. Okay. So you can't just screw around there either. Uh. <laughs> no, no. It's all pretty much supplied. We just bring our like lines and tiller and tiller extension and maybe your own hiking strap and uh, everything else is supplied. So you really don't have much of an option. So getting back, I guess, to the to where we are today, uh, how did you feel when you knew you'd be going to Tokyo? It was a bit of a mixed emotions, actually, because um, originally we were supposed to do a second trials event for our Olympic trials. We were supposed to go to Spain and compete. Um, I had a pretty big lead in the Olympic trials, but it was odd because um, that event ended up getting canceled. And so that was the end of our trial. So it's not like I got to go race an event, you know, finish super well and be like, that's it, finish, finish, cross finish line. And then like, I've qualified. It was just like, this event's now canceled. Okay, you're going to the Olympics. But um, for me, it was still exciting. You know, I, it was my first, it's going to be my first Olympics and I qualified and I've worked really hard um in the last four years especially to get that selection you know i qualified the country as well which is a big aspect and then i was selected myself so yeah i was i was really excited and of of course the support from the community is amazing uh can you talk about that a little bit i mean that's there's so much that goes into doing a campaign like this um how do you how do you feel that kind of community around you i mean in the canadian sailing community kind of helped you get where you are I wouldn't be where I am without them and the community. Um, just so, there's so many different aspects. I mean, a big part is fundraising. Um, you know, my budget is close to a hundred thousand per year when you're in full-time training and traveling. And so my home yacht club, Astros Bay has been incredible at supporting me and fundraising and, you know, sharing what I'm up to and, and having the newsletter that kind of gets shared to members along with just like the whole community in Canada and being so supportive, but not just um, financially, but also, you know, just the little things about sending a message saying congratulations or um, helping me lift my boat onto my car at the end of the day or something, you know, those little things really add up and it really makes a big difference. Yeah. Especially when you've got all this other kind of like logistics around everything that take, must just take so much time away from, you know, training and sailing or even just like recovering and relaxing. It's just got to be amazing to have that, that network of support. Um, yeah. I mean, I also have kind of got my dad on <laughs> helping me with my logistics. They, they call themselves Sarah Douglas support staff because they're so incredible. You know, there's been times where I've come home 
and I'm exhausted from traveling and competing and they'll just do my laundry or they'll buy groceries for me. And like those little things make such a big difference um, when you're on this Olympic journey. So when the pandemic hit, did you immediately know that it would affect the games? It was a very odd time. <laughs> it was, uh, we didn't know what was happening. I was days away from going to Spain for our original Olympic trials event. And uh, it was just things were getting shut down and we didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, Ontario and Canada was shutting down, the gyms were closing. And I actually flew to Barbados thinking, okay, where can I sail? I know I can sail here. I've got this incredible community that also supports me in Barbados. And I thought I was gonna go for two weeks and it was two months. And in that whole process, um, the Olympics were postponed. So how did you feel when you, you know, first heard they're gonna be postponed? You know, you've worked toward this goal for so long and now it's a little up in the air. Well, the first aspect of it that we had as Canadians was that Canada wasn't going to send athletes. They boycotted before it was Olymp um, announced that the Olympics were going to be postponed. So I was about to go to sleep um, after another day of training in Barbados, and I got this email saying Canada won't be sending athletes to the Olympic Games in Tokyo in 2020. And that in itself was an emotional roller coaster. And of course, everyone, um, all of my friends and community had really like being amazing with going out and reaching out to me and saying they're here to support me. But it was a couple days until um, the actual Olympics said that they were gonna postpone a year. So that time was really challenging mentally because um, yeah, it's something that I had looked forward to in the last couple of years. I'd put so much work into it um, you know, every day and Finding out that first your country's not going to send you, and then it's being postponed was certainly a roller coaster yeah. of emotions. But in the end, it's a sign of it was relief because we didn't know when you looked at if it had actually happened. We certainly weren't going to be prepared to have all of those athletes and support in Japan during a pandemic. Once they were postponed, how did you feel once you heard that that they were okay? Maybe maybe I get another shot. Yeah, it was just a sense of a relief because um, I was in the sprint until it was like four months out from the Olympics. You know, that's the final sprint to the finish. And so I just kind of took a deep breath and kind of reset. Uh, I made sure that the next time I went sailing, it was just for so much fun. You know, I was like, let's have a fun day and really enjoy the sport and why I do it. Um, and for me, it gave an opportunity to get one more year of training. I had actually had a back injury in the fall of 2019 and so I was missing some time in the boat. And so for me, it was an opportunity to get more time to prepare for, J for Japan and the Olympics um, and to become stronger in my back and everything that I did. So how did the pandemic affect your training? What, what changes did you have to make to your normal routine or to your plans? I mean, massively in the last year, gyms in Canada have been closed for most of the year. Um, I haven't touched a barbell since September, <laughs> so it's a lot different in that it's a lot of home workouts. Um, you know, the physical training is certainly different. I've kind of adapted and, and done, you know, home workouts. And then I've uh, gone on my road bike a lot as well. That's what I really took up during the pandemic. And then generally in the usual year for, before a pandemic, I would kind of do focus blocks. So I'd travel somewhere, whether that's Florida or Mexico or wherever in the winter. And um, I'd come home for two weeks. But now with the pandemic and Canada's got quite strict restrictions and quarantines, um, I was actually gone for seven months of this year. That's the longest I've ever been away from home. And I just got back. Um, I'm in quarantine right now. So um, it's certainly been a lot of a change and adaption in this pandemic but I've actually had the most sailing days that I've ever had in a year. Oh, so it's kind of like you got a little bit of a bonus here, which is great. Yeah, I've had a lot of time on the water. I mean, it just comes at a cost, you know, mm -hmm. you have to just manage your recovery and, and burnout and just kind of manage your energy levels. But I've had the most days sailing on the water, which is great. So one thing, I, being a sailor that uh, always annoys me is mm -hmm. when people are like, oh, sailing is not a sport. They don't really understand like the athletic side of it. Can you talk a little bit about like, you know, how you train, how you prepare, kind of what goes into this effort? 
Yeah, I mean, sailing is certainly an endurance sport. We're six days of competing. Each race is an hour long. Um, we do 10 or 11 races. And so that certainly you need to train for endurance. Um, I do a lot of bike riding. Um, all of my workouts are also endurance based. So I'll like toss skipping in between supersets or whatnot. Um, but it is a lot of energy put into the boat, especially the boat that I sail, you know, we hike, we kind of um, use our bodies to counteract the wind. And it's a lot of pain, yeah. <laughs> I would say the labor they'll in the legs and um, you just kind of embrace it. You know, you got to have a good pain tolerance, just trying to make the boat go as fast as you can. But it is an endurance sport and um, I'm in the gym and on the water and um, on the road bike to kind of get to the level that I need to be. So beyond that kind of like the training aspect of it, um, when you're going out and actually in a normal year, like kind of competing and training, or, you know, competing at a high level, what, what does that kind of look like? You know, where are you going? Kind of what, you know, what does it look like being a competitor in, in sailing? In a normal year, we're probably competing in six to eight competitions um, around the world. You know, last in 2019 or 2020, I was in Australia. I was in um, Poland. I was kind of all over the world. Wherever the competitions are, they change or can change each year. And then there's a circuit. And so we'll kind of pick what are our two events, what are our peak events and we're preparing for. And luckily, I have an amazing support team around me. So everyone kind of works together, you know, the coach, the strength and conditioning coach, the sports psychologist, the nutritionist, all kind of work together to make sure that I'm going to peak for the certain events. And we'll choose whether that's the world championships, the Pan Am games or something, um, or the Olympic games. And so everything we do is all kind of planned out. And um, you're tapering and, and doing the different aspects to make sure that you're going to be prepared for those competitions. So it, it all kind of depends and it's a lot of planning and scheduling that you kind of sit down and plan that out with your whole team. So this, you know, this Olympics is going to look quite a bit different than a normal games. Um, you know, one of the biggest aspects I think is just the restrictions on people being able to come see it. You, you talk about that community you have behind you. Um, how did you feel when you heard that no overseas visitors would be allowed? I was certainly bummed. Um, I know my parents before were fully booked to come to Japan. Um, actually, my family and my boyfriend were fully booked. And so I know my parents were certainly pretty upset that they couldn't come to Japan because they love traveling um, to my competitions to cheer me on. They've been all over the world to see me race and um, to be there for support. And so, yeah, they're bummed. I know they're going to kind of wake up in the middle of the night <laughs> in Japanese time make sure they're watching and they're going to be cheering me on and sending positive energy through the screen. I know that's big on my parents, but um, yeah, I understand that's not a possibility, but it's unfortunate. Yeah. How else do you think that the pandemic is going to kind of affect the whole experience just in terms of like the village, in terms of the competition itself? I think it's going to have a massive impact actually on the Olympics because um, there are very strict rules on distancing and where you can go. You know, we're very much limited to our little sailing bubble. You can only go to the village and then the sailing venue and you can't leave. You can't take public transit. Um, you're very much in a bubble. You know, we're not going to see Japan like we thought we were. Um, for me, I was excited about after competition to kind of going to the, the main village. You know, sailing is in a satellite village. So I was excited to kind of go check that out, you know. We're not going to be able to watch other sports. Um, we're not going to go to like the closing ceremony or opening ceremony. It's a bit, it's going to be different. I mean, the good thing is that there's no distractions. <laughs> and so you're kind of really focused on your competition because you don't have all this extra super cool Olympic stuff going on. It's just like, okay, I'm here to race, which is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and you're really focused. And so, yeah, that. It's going to be certainly very different Olympics. That's what they keep saying. They're like, don't compare it to other things. So now that we're you know, in the final push and the games are coming up, how do you feel about the games now? I'm excited. You know, I'm trying to treat it like any other competition. Um, and I think with the restrictions that we have, it's going to be easier, the less distractions. But 
Um, I'm just going out there to race. You know, no matter where you are, it's the same racing that we do worldwide. You know, it's the same course. Yeah, I mean, things will be different. The temperature is different and um, maybe there's a bit more media and a couple more protocols. But at the end of the day, racing is racing and uh, a laser is a laser. <laughs> and it's the same thing that I do every day. So I'm just going to try to keep it simple um, just to what I know and not do anything crazy and and race to the best of my ability. So, you know, the, the big focus of our show, obviously, is is the Great Lakes. Um, and you've sailed all over the world uh, and get to travel a lot of cool places. Have you gotten the chance to do much sailing like in the Great Lakes outside of you know your home club and home waters? I've sailed a lot in the Great Lakes. I think I've gotten four, four out of the five. I think I'm just missing Lake Superior. Um, but I've, yeah, especially when I was younger, I did a lot of sailing, um, you know, in Chicago or Sarnia, um, Buffalo, you know, that kind of covers a bunch of the Great Lakes and yeah, it's Detroit. I've also sailed in, um, yeah, I've sailed a lot in the, in the Great Lakes and it's got each, each one has its different, um, specialty. There's such a mental aspect of sailing that like you can do every single thing right you can have you know your body prep the boat prep your plan your strategy everything mm -hmm. and stuff just doesn't go your way you know like a wind flip comes through and then next thing you know you're at the back of the fleet yeah. you know it changes Are there, is there any kind of like strategy or technique you use to kind of manage that like at a super high level like you know specifically looking at the games i mean like this is the pinnacle everything you've been doing leading up to this and you still have that unknown yeah i mean i think a lot of it I've worked with a sports psychologist and um, I do quite a bit of meditation. I meditate every day before sailing and it's only like three to five minutes, but I find doing that kind of helps me refocus. And then I actually journal as well, um, just to have that focus aspect and that um, I like know exactly what I'm going to do. Like I have my specific techniques that I write out and I'll even write things like cool, calm, collected, just to like have some mindset pieces. And I find that aspect of it really helps with my racing. So like, if you have a really bad race, you can kind of do some breathing and reset. Be like, okay, what can I focus on now? What are my cues? This is what I need to work on technique wise. You talk it through with your coach and then you're like, okay, ready to go next race. It's like kind of wipe the slate. Um, that's an awesome answer, by the way. It's making me like kind of <laughs> miss some of like that actual, like really intense ceiling. I, Cause I had the same thing I did like, cause the only thing I did for so long. And then I just hit a point where I was like, mm -hmm not good enough to really go any further or like get somewhere so i think i'm yeah, but everything with sailing there's so many different aspects of it you know you don't have to go out racing like i love going out for a cruise i love going out with friends and just on a friday friday afternoon and just going and cruising the toronto harbor for example like it's so nice well sarah thanks so much for talking to me it's been a real pleasure and good luck in tokyo at Great Lakes Now, we aim to cover the Great Lakes region and the people who live here, like you. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for our newsletter at greatlakesnow.org.